there are some still some people trickling in, but I will get started because it's 6.30. And um, I'm going to explain the format of the evening and how we've been kind of running town halls. And uh, okay, so I'm State Rep Jennifer O'Mara. This is my second town hall. Um, so what I've been typically doing is sort of introducing myself because there's a lot of folks who I've never yet met before, explaining why I'm your state rep and how I ended up being your state rep because a lot of people have that question. Um, <laughs> and uh, go, I'm gonna address some of the biggest issues that we've received phone calls about, just go over them right off the bat and then we're happy to take questions. If anyone wants to submit questions um, just to help the process, or we have uh, cards over there and um, you can also just raise your hand and ask questions at the end. Um, so uh, I am a newly elected rep. I think I've been in office 155 days. I count it today. It doesn't, it feels like a lot longer, uh, but it's been a really wonderful experience. I decided to run for office for a myriad of reasons, but I was really motivated by my own personal life. Uh, when I was young, I was born in Philadelphia. My dad was a fireman in the city and my, a firefighter in the city and my mom was a stay at home mom. And when I was 13, we lost my father to gun suicide and that changed everything for our family. It's the reason we moved to Delaware County, and without things like my dad's pension, he was a union member in the fire department, uh, or public schools, um, or CHIP, or my mom getting hired as a school bus driver because she was a single mom with a high school diploma and hadn't worked in 15 years, and that was a good union job that gave her good wages and benefits, which were so critical for us, we wouldn't have made it. And it was after the last presidential election that I felt regardless of where your politics fell in that election, it was an ugly election that was not focused on the issues that matter in most households, it was focused on negativity. And I felt like the people that we had in office weren't really representing average, everyday, working class people in Delaware County. And I was going to try and do something about that. Um, no one was more surprised than me on election night that you all entrusted me with this amazing privilege. Um, but it's been quite an experience. To be honest, people in Harrisburg are not really used to a young woman being a state rep. So more than once I've had to say, no, I'm not a staffer or an intern, or I'm actually the rep and I'm from my own office. Um, but it's, it's, it's a good thing that I think needs to change in Pennsylvania politics. This year, I'm proud to say, after we just had a special election and another woman got elected, there are now 54 women serving in the Pennsylvania House, which is more women than have ever served in history. Yes, that does always deserve a round of applause. Um, I also want to just take a moment and recognize that today is the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Uh, my grandfather's uncle was a paratrooper who jumped on the beaches the night before the invasion. He was shot 12 times, but he lived to tell the tale. Um, so this day is very important for us to remember because this may be the last historic um, anniversary where the veterans who invaded those beaches are actually alive with us. So I just want to take a moment. I hope you all had a chance to recognize today and why it's so significant as well. Um, okay, so since I've been in Harrisburg, there have been, uh, I've been put on three committees. I'll start with some of the things I'm doing. Um, and some of them, you, you don't really get to choose which committees you're put on. I was able to make some requests. Some were met, some were not. But I am on the Veterans and Emergency Preparedness Committee, the Aging and Older Adult Services Committee, and the Transportation Committees. All of those committees, I believe, are very reflective of Delaware County and of the district that I represent. Uh, Veterans and Emergency Preparedness also covers first responders, so firefighters and police officers and uh, paramedics, which is something that's really important to me and personal to me and important for Delaware County, frankly. Um, so I'm excited about my committee assignments. I'm also the first vice chair of the Southeast delegation in the Democratic Caucus. And in the Democratic Caucus, the Southeast delegation is the largest delegation. Um, and I think I'm the first freshman to be put in a leadership position like that. It was an appointed position. So I'm really excited to be able to bring that voice um, for us at the table. I also started my own caucus, the Student Debt Caucus. You may have heard about this because I've recently gotten a lot of press surrounding this issue. Um, and what this caucus is, um, working with a Republican member of the House, Megan Schroeder, she's also a newly elected member from Bucks County. And we've convened about 25 members. It's almost 50-50 bipartisan. 
And we are looking at why does Pennsylvania have the most student loan debt per graduate in the country. And we're not looking at it just uh, how do we make college free, which is something that people keep asking me because that's not that has not been talked about at the table. Instead, we're looking at why are predatory loans going after students? Why are interest rates so high? Why are university costs so high and rising every day? Uh, why does it take 18 and a half years working minimum wage to pay off college right now when in the 70s it would took, take five and a half years working a minimum wage job to pay off college? And how can we educate high school students on other options beyond college if college isn't meant for them? Because we have a lot of good uh, trade jobs and other jobs that students can enter that don't require a degree or they can go to community college so there's there's I have three brothers to still go through college so it's important that we show them that maybe that's not the only option and what can we do to give them an affordable uh, income when they graduate from high school I'm also the co-chair of the firefighters caucus which is really exciting for me because here in Pennsylvania we're facing a shortage a crisis frankly of volunteer firefighters in the 70s, we used to have about 300,000, and now they think we have under 38,000, and that's counting firefighters who run in multiple departments because many of them volunteer in more than one department. So we need to do something about that. One of the options that's out there right now is actually student debt forgiveness if we can get people to stay in Pennsylvania and become a volunteer firefighter. So that's something we just talked about on the floor the other day, and there's a bill that's being put together to address that. So trying to find ways to deal with these problems together. Um, I'm also in, in Radnor, I think it'd be important to mention I'm in the Climate Caucus. Um, in Radnor, I hear a lot about environmental concerns and infrastructure concerns, frankly, and a lot of that has to do with the changing, ever-changing climate. So it's uh, a group that gets to convene We've met with the governor a few times and our leaders a few times to talk about DEP funding, DEP concerns, and other uh, PennDOT and other issues that we're dealing with. Um, okay, so now I wanna talk about some of the biggest issues that I hear about uh, from constituents in Radnor. Top on the list is PennDOT issues. In the fall, in the winter, it was a lot of pothole concerns and I drove the roads that we heard about. I know how serious it was. Lisa Browski and I worked together. She took a video that we sent to PennDOT. I had the secretary of PennDOT in my office in Harrisburg and I showed her the video and um, we've worked really hard. Larry and my, I and my staff have worked really hard to build a relationship because at the end of the day PennDOT is understaffed. District 6 is understaffed and so we know that if we want them to come to Radnor to address our concerns at a very timely manner, we need to make sure they answer the phone when we call, that they like us when we ask them for things, and we build a relationship. So we went to their District 6 location, Larry and I, and met with the staff and heard their concerns. We also brought PennDOT here in April to have an infrastructure hearing and to hear directly from the township manager about what's going on in Radnor, to talk about why we don't want Radnor Township to have to continue to fix state roads because that's costing our taxpayer dollars money. Um, and Bob at the last meeting said that for the first time they're actually getting responses and we're actually moving some things forward. So today, I know it's not PennDOT, it's a different infrastructure issue. Uh, Larry met with residents concerning the Earls Lake Dam, which isn't actually in Radnor Township, but Radnor Township homes and residents are on the other side of the dam. And Steve uh, from the township mentioned that for the first time, again, they're actually hearing from the DEP. So we're starting to see progress by building relationships with the state agencies, but please continue to call our office and report any road issues that you're having because we keep track of everything we send every concern directly to PennDOT. We have a, a list that we brought with them from all the concerns we had compiled in April, and that kind of data helps build our case. So please continue to call, and we make sure we get back to you and know we are also working really hard to uh, work with PennDOT. One of the things I've learned is PennDOT spends $12 million a year, $5 million in our district alone cleaning up trash. So we are working on some initiatives to try and curb litter because that is a huge problem. You'll see it all along the blue route. Um, they can come and clean and a week later you won't even tell that they did because if they mowed the grass, they cleaned up the litter. Um, but that's a lot of money that I think the state agency could be using to fund our roads. 
Um, I'm also putting together, if any of you are at the Radnor Township hearing, um, I've asked for a piece of legislation to be written. It's not going to be popular statewide, but it will be in Delaware County, uh, where if a state road does not have a thousand or more cars being used on it, then that is not really uh, necessitating state funds be used to require because state funds are supposed to be used on roads to contain and maintain state commerce. So I'm putting that bill forward. Being completely honest, knowing I probably won't pass until I get to be in the majority and push that to pass uh, because people in the middle of the state aren't going to want their roads to be taken back. But I'm still going to fight for it because it's not going to change if we don't have that conversation. Um, okay, another a uh, big issue that happened since I've been in office in Radnor, you probably have heard um, Stephanie Miller was murdered in the Wawa on Lancaster Avenue. It was definitely the darkest day I've had in office so far when I was calling Chief Flanagan and Lisa Dabrowski and anyone I could find at 6 a.m. on Friday morning when I woke up and found out. Um, but I want you to know that I am trying to do everything I can to pass laws that would prevent something like that from happening again. Um, the one piece of legislation that would have directly impacted that uh, actually passed the House last year but wasn't into effect yet, there is a domestic abuse law now that if someone has a PFA against them and they own a firearm, it would be removed, but it didn't go into effect yet. Um, and the PFA in that situation wasn't even in place. However, this bill, HB 1075, it's on the docket this session, would create extreme risk protection orders in Pennsylvania. What this would do is if a, fa if a person is in crisis or if they're threatening to hurt themselves or others, it would give a family member an option with a judge to take away their firearms temporarily. It's a way to protect due process, in fact, for the person who it's removing the firearms from. So, in two states, the ACLU have endorsed this bill, Colorado and Pennsylvania, and every other state they deem it unconstitutional because of due process. And it also is better than 302-ing. Right now, the only option to take care of someone is to call 302 and put them in an institution. In that case, your firearms are removed from you permanently, no matter what, no matter what the outcome of the situation. So this is a way to help protect the Second Amendment, but also protect everyone's lives, because that's also very important, especially as we see um, this bill would specifically help to curb suicides. We've seen where states where they've passed extreme risk protection orders, suicides by firearms have decreased. And yes, it's personal for me, but it's also two-thirds of deaths by firearms are caused by suicide, and in Pennsylvania, it's the highest number of deaths related to firearms. So this bill could also help. I also recognize it's not the only solution, mental health funding and funding of special education in schools, because that's where they take care of mental health in schools now, is also really important, and that's something I'm equally fighting to make sure we have funding for in, in Pennsylvania. Um, all right, another bill that I've heard a lot about was HB 321, which would have uh, implemented an abortion ban if there was a diagnosis of Down syndrome or the belief of a diagnosis of Down syndrome. I want to explain that why I voted no on this bill. Um, I felt like this bill was directly interfering with women and doctors and their ability to make the best decision for women. A few weeks before we voted on this bill, we voted on a bill that would allow doctors to prescribe long-term antibiotics to anyone suffering from Lyme's disease. And the argument that was used was that doctors should be able to make the best decision for their patients. I believe that, provide, that extends to women's health as well. And I will support any measure that comes down to the floor that would provide benefits for people with Down syndrome or provide benefits to families who choose to continue with their pregnancies and protect and preserve those lives. But I felt like this was, um, something that would have caused more harm than good in the end. And I also am trying to be very representative of the district, and I had a lot of constituents reach out, and a majority of them were asking me to vote no on the bill. So please, if there's a bill moving that you feel very strongly about, reach out to me, because I do value your opinion, and we do our best to answer every single person that contacts us. Um, the, the I think that's enough I want to say for now. Now I'm happy to take questions. I don't know if anyone's, sub no? Okay, so if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand because it doesn't sound like anyone submitted any. Yes? Well, what about the issue of the barrier? Oh, yes. 
thank you for bringing that up. So I am also co-sponsor on two bills in the House uh, that are related to gerrymandering. Um, right now, we are going to have new districts no matter what. In 2020, after the census, the House, the General Assembly, will be responsible for drawing new state House, state Senate, and federal districts. So our nice, newly carved fifth district in all of Delaware County is going to change. All of the federal maps are going to change because Pennsylvania is losing a congressional seat uh, due to population. So as current law stands, written by the Constitution, this process will take place by a, frankly, partisan board. Uh, two Republican staffers, two Democratic staffers will sit on the board. They're supposed to agree for a fifth. They historically never agree. So the Supreme Court will port, appoint the fifth person, and then they will draw the lines. Um, what we are trying to do is create a new way to draw districts because that, and when it's drawn that way, it's gerrymandering. And what that means is they draw the districts to support incumbents, to support voters that they want. Uh, you can look at Radnor. It's a great example of gerrymandering. It's the example I use all over the state. Um, so these two bills that are out there would create a nonpartisan commission, an independent commission that would consist of lawyers and other professionals who would be drawing districts based on the lines that exist in the counties and what's best for the communities. Um, and the reason there are two bills is because one of them would uh, directly address drawing congressional and the other would directly address drawing the House and the Senate because they're state seats. So I'm a co-sponsor of both of them. To be completely honest with you, I don't know if they will pass because people who have been in Harrisburg for a very long time on both sides of the aisle want things to stay the same. They don't want to change. And all the new freshmen, again, on both sides of the aisle, we're pushing for reforms. We're pushing for term limits and to draw fair districts and things like that and, and have better rules in the House. You wouldn't believe the way I told you the rules are passed in the House. Um, so. There's a lot of energy. I think both bills have about 70 co-sponsors, and both have bipartisan co-sponsors, but neither will get a hearing. And unless we can get the committee chair of the Committee of State Government to run the bills, they're not going to run. And they have to run this year. You may wonder why 2019, because it's 2020. We have a little bit of time. It's a constitutional amendment to change the way we draw districts. So this bill would have to pass in this session then immediately again in the new session in 2021 and then be voted on by that primary in order to even go into place. So we're in a very strict timeline. If you want to get involved with this issue, the best nonpartisan group is Fair Districts, Pennsylvania. So. So first, I would say contact Fair Districts PA Delaware County. There is a Delaware County chapter. Um, then I would say, you, you know where I stand on it, um, but you're welcome to contact the other Radnor representative to make sure he's signed on to the bills. And frankly, other Delaware County representatives. Um, many of them say unless they hear from residents, they don't sign on to co-sponsor bills. I don't agree with that. I signed on before I heard from anyone, but that's that's just my opinion. Um, I also think you should contact the majority chair of the state government committee. And, and can you confirm that's where those bills were sent, that committee? Um, the reason I say that is because in Harrisburg, no bill gets to the floor unless it first goes through committee. And the committees are all run by the majority chairs. And the majority chairs get to decide what bills go on the agenda, what bills get moved through their committee, even what bills get assigned to their committee. So they're the best person to try to pressure. And you can also always talk, uh, call the offices of the speaker. I always encourage people to call the offices of the speaker and share your opinion about fair districts. Yes. Thank you. Um, on the college piece, the, um, I have a son that just graduated from school this year. Mm -hmm. um, the Pitt and Penn State, I believe, are the highest cost for state university education. And why is that? So, <laughs> Okay. 
Okay. Okay, I'll go get to that. First. So the first question, though, is so Penn State, Temple, Pitt, they're not actually in-state schools. It's, it's a confusing thing because they do get a line of state funding. That state funding has to be used in very specific ways at each university. Uh, university of Penn gets one. They can only use it for Penn Vet and funding the vet school and the hospital in Newtown Square. Um, Penn State has to uh, run the Master Gardeners program all across the state. So we have a Master Gardeners chapter here in Delaware County. They're supposed to help you with agriculture projects. Um, and they're bigger, in, obviously, in other parts of the state. But I've had Penn State in my office. I'm actually, because of my student debt work, university presidents are now agreeing to meet with me. Pitt's, Pitt's meeting with me soon as well. So is ACUP, so is Villanova. Um, Temple, I, a whole list of schools have reached out. And I'm asking them, why are your rates so expensive? And that's something that the Republicans in the caucus really want to go after. So one of the ideas that Frank Ryan, who is a member from Lehigh County, has come up with. So I, I have a drink over here because I'm not feeling well today. Um, and it's like, it shows you your ingredients. We want to know why colleges don't do this. Why don't you know exactly where your tuition rates are going and where, what's the breakdown and how much is it going towards administrative costs versus student actual student costs? So that's something I want to look at and address. Um, and I frankly want to ask the question, if you're getting state funding, even that line, why are your rates so high and, and why are we, I don't know, putting money into sports instead of schools? I don't know, just a thought. So it's definitely something I'm asking about. All right, now about elections. So I think we can all agree that protecting our elections is a priority. Um, we have had a hearing in the Veterans and Emergency Preparedness Committee with the Department of uh, DMVA, Military and Veterans Affairs, and this stuff falls under them because that's our homeland security in Pennsylvania. We don't have an actual homeland security uh, department for a state. And they are very concerned. They're aware that we've had interference, and they want to make sure it doesn't happen again. So we are mandating every municipality by the 2020 presidential election to have new voting machines, and they need to have paper ballots. So Delaware County is on record to change over by the next primary. Um, I think tonight was the yeah, there was, a, there was an expo tonight that Delaware County held where you could go test their samples. But I will be honest with you, they have not yet decided what machine in Delaware County we are going to get. And I've heard that the majority on county council wants to get a type of machine that would still rely on a barcode, not a paper ballot. That is not taking technology out of it. So uh, in the way that we think we should with paper ballots. So I encourage you to talk to county council about this. They're still in the process of finding vendors and picking the right machine and making sure that Delaware County does the right thing. So uh, county council meets Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Um, they often have summer evening meetings. Um, throughout the year, they have a couple. We will do our best to share their evening meeting if they're having any this summer on my social media. But you can also just contact your county council. And friendly tip, Brian Zydek lives in Radnor. So talk to Brian Zydek, Radnor 4th Ward. He's on county council. If you need his contact, let me know. So in Chester County, so I went to college in Westchester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but they have them to count if we were to need a recount. So when I went to college in Westchester, I voted in Westchester, and you would fill in, it's like a, a standardized test. Yeah, you have to fill in the little dots, and then you send it through a machine, and it gets counted. Right now in Delaware County, we have electro electronic booths. So if you want to hear a story about election night, um, we get after election, polls close at 8 p.m., and each uh, party is allowed to have people in there watching the count to make sure you have to have a poll watch certificate, but to make sure everything's happening the way it's supposed to. So a little tape kind of stick prints out like a credit card machine from each poll to give you the totals, and that's what you count, and then they count the absentees. Then a USB drive comes out of the machine. That is taken to the county courthouse, which is uploaded into their system, and that's how they get the machine counts. They verify that against the tapes. 
Well, in Radnor, one of those USBs did not make it back to the county courthouse in November of 2018, Radnor 4th Ward. So there's confusion over the 165th district on election night and uh, the other, no one would uh, concede. We knew the results almost down to the number because we had volunteers in every polling place, but they had to go find that USB the next day. It was taken back wherever the machines are stored, it was taken back there and they had to pull it out and bring it back to the county and finish counting later. So that kind of stuff is happening when you don't have paper ballots to, you know, what would have happened if we wouldn't have found that? That was a ward in Radnor Fourth Ward that wouldn't have been counted. That does not deserve to happen to any American citizen. So I think it's a priority that we fix it. This week, I also introduced a new piece of legislation that would bring early voting to Pennsylvania. And we actually introduced a package of reforms around Election Day. Early voting, allowing 16 and 17 year olds to early register, pre-register, and also uh, if you one bill would be if you uh, automatic registration. So if you interact with PennDOT at all, you would automatically be registered to vote. Another one is opting people in rather than opting you out to vote. Because here in America, I think we had 20% participation in election day on May 21st, if, if we're lucky. Um, and I, I, we all deserve to vote. So my bill would bring early voting to PA 30 days out at the County Board of Elections and um, we would be the 37th state to implement early voting. So this is not a new uh, or crazy idea. Um, Virginia is becoming the next state in 2020 to bring early voting. So if you also want these election reforms, state government committee is definitely where to talk to. They actually did have a hearing about it last week. So there's definitely interest on both sides of the aisle to make some of these changes before next year. All right, yes. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, heard all the uh, comments from PennDOT about the cost of potholes repair and so forth and so on. At that meeting, there was a Villanova professor mm -hmm. who talked about sort of just a cost data. I'm sorry? Robbie Shader. Robbie Shader, yes, thank you. I talked to him after the meeting because we had already adjourned and so forth, but we had a chance to talk to you later. Mm -hmm. Is anyone working on improving those materials so that they last much longer than what's being used today? And he said, yes, there is a group at Penn State University that is working on that. So I would request you to take a look at that and see if there's a way that we can specify materials that are used that will last much longer. Because right now we're just getting potholes every year, the same stuff just keeps disappearing and so forth. Robbie, you're saying. No, I, I absolutely agree. I'm looking over there. Amanda, you're taking notes, right? Yes. We can definitely look into that. I wonder if that's the master gardeners that are looking into that at Penn State. I doubt it. But that's a really good point. And it's really critical as we look at the weather, right? Because just this past winter, we had so many hot and then cold and then ice and then we're plowing and then it's warm again and that changing weather is not helping the material on the roads. Um, and I drove further north this year, and it, the further north you go, the worse the potholes get in Pennsylvania. So I definitely think that's a worthwhile cause, and I will look at I'm sure, to be honest with you, one of the things I'll hear about is that's going to cost more. But it's a long-term investment, yeah. right? It'll cost more initially, but in the long run... It will be, yeah, I agree. I agree, and, and it's important that people recognize making long-term investments is an important thing that we have to do in Pennsylvania. They do a lot of band-aiding on things in PA, and that's not helping. All right, anyone else have questions? Sure. So I'm of the elk of being very honest with my constituents. So I'm going to be honest, the NRA has a big foothold in Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the biggest rally days that we've seen so far was the pro-Second Amendment uh, rally event they had in May. So unless we can get a 
bill that both sides agree on for, it's not going to pass this session. I'm hopeful that the extreme risk protection order is one that we have bipartisan support on or that we can get bipartisan support on because both bills, the House version and the Senate version, have been introduced by Republican members and they're in the majority right now. Todd Stevens is the member who introduced it in the House. And he's a former prosecutor and a firearms prosecutor, so he brings a really unique perspective. Um, and then Senator Tom Killian from Delaware County is the Senate version in uh, prime sponsor. So reach out to them and thank them. They need to hear from people in PA and let them know that they have support and there are people that are behind them. Um, and I will note that the bill that passed last session, the one I mentioned about domestic abuse, was the first bill that passed about gun violence in Pennsylvania in how many decades. It was a historic mo moment. Um, Yesterday, I spoke at a rally with Governor Wolf and Senator Art Haywood in the fifth annual gun violence prevention rally, and Senator Haywood had a photo that showed there were 13 people at the one five years ago, and that one, if you look at my Facebook page, it was huge. So we are seeing momentum. Um, I will also say that I made this an issue when I ran for office, and I think we have to continue to make this an issue we vote on. And that's the best way we're gonna see things change in Pennsylvania. But extreme risk protection order has a good chance. Universal background checks and loss and soul mandating reporting is another one that might. But I think as you get further into any sort of regulation, there's not gonna be much hope this session. Again, I'm just being very honest. Yes. Yeah. So um, last year, I think we had over 18 air helicopter air rescues in Pennsylvania that we had to do as a result of flooding, because this is, is historic, the amount of flooding and rain we're seeing. So I know in Radnor, uh, stormwater flooding is a huge issue. The commissioners are working very diligently on this. I've also, we applied for a grant to um, get our cap support from the state, which would help with some of these solutions. Um, but at the end of the day, the DEP is underfunded and understaffed. And the best thing that we can do to start getting solutions is to fill those jobs and get that department funded. Right now, sadly, the governor is introducing in his budget that he introduced in February more cuts to the DEP. So it's a bad situation. We I actually talked about this a little bit before you got here. Um, so one of the things I've joined is this, this climate caucus that I mentioned. And it's about 20 legislators, almost all from the Southeast, um, who have been meeting with our leadership and the governor to pressure the governor to put that funding back because they can't further raid the DEP. It's only going to get worse. These situations that you're describing are going to become catastrophic if we don't do something. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Johnstown, yeah, so, I mean, and it's, ha I mean, we just had tornadoes in Pennsylvania, I mean, the weather is changing fr frantically, and we need to do something, so one of the governor's initiatives is restore PA, if we can get this bill passed, it would be huge, it would give uh, billions of dollars to infrastructure projects, and I'm, 
was just in his office last week about getting some of that in Delaware County. Um, we need to get it passed first. So the best thing we can do right now is pressure the legislature to pass Restore PA. The funding that would, the mechanism that is built in Restore PA is passing a severance tax on the fracking industry in Pennsylvania. Right now, we are the only state in the whole country that has a fracking industry and no severance tax. So it means communities like ours, which are being changed every day by pipelines where the product is coming through Delaware County to end at the refineries, which is important because it's jobs in Delaware County, uh, but we're not getting any revenue to fix our environmental problems that are only being exacerbated by underfunding. So I'm a co-sponsor of Restore PA, which I did intentionally because it now gives me a seat at the table to go when I email the governor's team and say, hey, I have an issue, we can deal with it. Um, frankly, about this particular Earl's Lake issue, I'm going to sit next to Chris Quinn on the floor on one day morning and ask him why he's not doing anything and what we can do to get him involved because that's his district if it's a new town. And uh, we were at an environmental event a couple weeks ago, and he said he agrees with us on most environmental issues. Remember, you were there. So I'm going to get him to help me because if two reps are going at the governor about it, it should have a little bit more depth. But we really need to focus on funding of the DEP because the DEP, I think, is another one of those agencies that we have really bad feelings about, but they are so underfunded. They have how many vacancies did I – I think it was like – over 450 vacancies the last time I checked. And when they're in charge of all the permits and approvals and regulations, that's not the agency we want to underfund. So if you have people, get them involved with calling your legislators about Restore PA or calling uh, the majority chairs, the ma I mean the people that are going to decide. That's a part of the budget mechanism too. So we should know if this is going to pass by the end of the month. Do you have a on no, but I can find out for you. You can, we're email buddies now, so I'll get back to you. If anyone wants to email me, I will give you my email because he can attest to it. We, I get back to people and try, it, it, it really does make a difference, I think. Did you notice Steve said he now is at least getting the DEP to answer today? That's an interesting change as well. All right, any other questions? Amanda? That's the fair districts bill. So, Representative Everett, okay. Thank you. So that's Amanda. She's my chief of staff. She's another amazing force of nature. If you ever need anything, call her. Sitting next to her is Larry Healy. He is my constituent services advisor. He is very good at getting PennDOT to respond to issues. So uh, we're working on DEP next. Um, but we've had, oh, oh, he's raising his hand as well. Hold on, I'm going to introduce my staff and then. Um, in the back, we have Valerie. She just joined us. She is a student from Delaware County Community College that is also working part-time in our office to help me with communications and social media because I'm a very busy rep and it's hard to keep up with me. Um, and we met by accident when I was walking around during the election and I said, are you registered to vote? And now it's, she was a journalist of Delaware County Community College and now she's helping us as well. Um, and my husband's here and I'm only calling him out because it's his birthday. So thank him for spending his birthday. He's also a veteran with two Purple Hearts, served two tours of duty in Afghanistan in combat. And Brad always deserves recognition. And Larry's raising his hand, which means he has a comment as well. I just wanted to follow up on Brandon's comment about the different cycles. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm.
Oh, wow. At Drexel? Okay. Will you email that article to me? I'll try to meet with the professor. Um, okay, does anyone else have any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. In the same article, they said in the newspaper about uh, the fact that we're using brine a lot on roads now. In other words, they're forecasting snow. Mm -hmm. We're getting excess salt in the water table, much higher than anybody has forecast and predicted. I don't know exactly what that means yet, but I'm just trying to do it. No. So. That's. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it absolutely is. Um, I'm not, I believe Radner gets their water from Aqua. Is that correct? So one of the first tours I did when I was in office, because I, 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 I did a sort of a listening tour and I went around everywhere. Aqua is based in our district and they're, uh, pri they were founded in Springfield by Swarthmore professors actually is a very fascinating story. But I did a tour of their facility and they do a lot of testing of our water before we're drinking it. So they also have a chief environmental officer and they have a site in Bryn Mawr actually off of Lancaster Avenue where they test uh, water for other types of things. So. I know, th I'm not saying you're wrong, it's definitely a major issue, but at least feel comforted in knowing that Aqua does a lot of diligence to make sure that what we drink uh, is clean. They actually, in Springfield, it's interesting, so there's chlorine in our water, we all know that, it uh, sometimes smells like it. Um, in Springfield, they had decided not to allow Aqua to put it just in their water, but after, for, certain amount of years they could no longer avoid it so they had to increase the amount so everyone in Springfield smelled it for a while and Aqua was getting a lot of crap about it but they work really hard to make sure that our rates stay low while they're keeping our water clean but if anyone wants to go on a tour I'd be happy to ask and see if they would take you there so if you'd be interested let me know uh, all right one other announcement to make and I'm gonna stay and hang out if anyone else has questions for me um, but we are having an event in Radnor on June 14th at the Wayne Senior Center at 10 a.m. We're gonna have breakfast for everyone and we'll have state, uh, we're gonna have actually Delaware County agencies, COSA and Deprise on site to talk about health benefits and how uh, they can help senior citizens applying for health benefits. We'll also have the Radnor Police on hand and my staff will be there. We have uh, mobile SEPTA card keys, so if you still have not yet gotten yours, you can stop by, we can take your picture on site and take care of that for you. They'll mail it to your house a couple weeks, uh, two to four weeks later. We like to say they're usually closer to two than four and it's true. Um, we're also having a shred event in Radnor at the Township Building on June 22nd. What time does it start? Nine to 12. Nine to 12 or nine to whenever the truck gets full. So I'm, I'm emphasizing that. <laughs> um, so get here early. Uh, we will make sure we take as many things as we can, but it's paper shredding. Um, no, I'm working on that. It's hard to get rid of electronics. So what I'm trying to do whenever I see a free event, like um, Franklin Mint Credit Union has them, Staples has them every once in a while, I'm emailing you all in my community emails about it. So if you have not yet signed up for my emails, you can do so at repomara. or it's, I'm sorry, pahouse.com slash repomara, or just let us know and we can sign you up. Um, but we do try to let people know about that because it's expensive. Um, I know my own township, it's very expensive. I live in Springfield. Um, but uh, the Shred event will be paper products and we're gonna have another one in um, September. I did find an electronics company that I'm not allowed to bring because as a state government entity, I'm not allowed to have a vendor come and sell you anything. However, I can send an email about it and offer, they come to you and take bulk items. So it's a company, I mean, it's, it's um, scrap recycling. Scrap recyclers will come take any big appliances because of what it's made of. So if you have something big in your house, look into scrap recycling. But don't tell them I sent you if you find the company. 
Uh, all right. Does anyone else have any questions? This is I'm not. I'm so surprised. And Morton, they were like asking me questions until the very end. No. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. I know it's uh, it's a new thing to be engaging in state government, but I think it's really really important that we have these kind of town halls. So I will have another one in Radnor uh, next year for sure, if not before then. And keep an eye out in the winter, we'll have telephone town halls because we know people like to hear from us but don't like to leave their homes in the winter. So we had one in March and it was a great success and we'll definitely do it again. So thank you. Oh, one more? Teleport. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? And keep your eye uh, out for the budget. This is budget month. The budget should be passing by June 30th. But there is a misconception. It's not like the federal government. If the budget doesn't pass, things will still function because the budget that we're working under right now is for, we pass for the year. So we're, we will still be okay, um, but we need to pass a budget on time. So pressure uh, the leaders if you're not seeing that happen as well. And please feel free to get in touch with me. My email is Rep O'Mara, so R E P O M as in Michael, A R A, at P A House dot net. Yeah, it's an, it's an old doubt, it's an outdated one, dot net. Um, but I monitor those emails and I do my best to answer you within a timely manner because I'm answering them myself. So, the budget. The Appropriations Chair, the Appropriations Committee, they're the ones that meet every day. So if you go on to the PA House website, you can search by committee. Look at the Appropriations Committee. All of those folks are the ones making the decisions. And I will be frank, it is a lot of dog and pony show deal making up there. It's horrifying the way that they make deals about stuff. So I'm not on the Appropriations Committee, therefore I am not involved in any of these conversations and I only find out about it when I go and ask the leader for it. Um, the big sticking points of this budget, restore PA, that's the governor's big fight. He wants to see that pass. Raising minimum wage is a big push in this budget. The minimum wage is 725 and has not been raised in Pennsylvania for over a decade. And if you look at all of our surrounding states, it's higher. So the governor's proposal is $12 with an incremental raise to 15. To be honest, I think it's going to be lower than that, but I do think we're going to have a raise. I'm, we're feeling really good about it. Um, there's also basic education funding is still at a good level. Special education funding could be increased, but is at a good level. And there's a proposal to help increase the base salary of teachers. Right now, in Delaware County, we don't really deal with this. Our teachers start at a good salary. But there are parts of the state where you start at $18,000 a year as a teacher, which is not a feasible salary. Yeah, that's so this bill would mandate a teacher salary start at $40,000 a year, which is what we're seeing in Delaware County, mostly higher than that, frankly, in Delaware County. So it's not going to impact any of our schools. Um, but it's, I think, really important because education is a priority and educating our kids should be a priority. Um, so they're the big po points of the budget that we'll be debating. But um, we were there this week for three days, and we could have gotten done work in one day. It's very frustrating. We'll be back next week for three days, and then the following week, four days, and the following week for five days. So there's no excuse that we don't get this done. We've been in Harrisburg a lot this year. So they, I, I, yeah, because it, you're forcing their office to respond, and and they keep track of the number. What I've learned is Harrisburg used to be under the radar, everyone's radar. No one knew what was happening in Harrisburg. After the presidential election of 2016, everyone sort of woke up to politics, and now they're paying attention to government at every level. The commissioners will attest to that, too. Um, so Harrisburg, they can't stand all the attention that they have. I hear my colleagues complain all the time about the rallies and the number of visitors they have and the number of calls they get and all these protesters. And it's wonderful the pressure that you put on people because they're not used to it. So keep it up. But your Delaware County has, a, we have some appropriation people. So you're welcome to contact them. You're always welcome to contact me. We keep track of this stuff and I go talk about it with my other rep. So let me know how you feel as well. But when you know how I feel about something, the best thing to do is pressure the leaders that are making the decisions. 
You're always welcome. I'll give you a map and star it. No, seriously, if you ever want to come visit me, uh, we set up. We can set up tours for you that you can get a tour of the Capitol. And if I'm there, I can get you down onto the floor, which is a really neat experience because you're not d allowed down there unless your rep is there. They're weird about visitors in June, though we can still make it work. Um, Cabrini actually won a national championship, so they're going to be coming in – the fall to be honored and there'll be a big luncheon and we'll all recognize them on the floor so if people want to come when that happens because Gabrini's from Radnor that would be a really neat experience but in July and August when we're not in session that would be a great time to try to schedule trips up to the Capitol if you really just want to see the Capitol building because it's beautiful and it's yours so you should come and see it and learn the history it's been around since 1906 and was built with electricity in 1906. It's amazing, but it's stunning, and I'd love to have you. I've had other constituents up there, and I go on the tours whenever I can, and you learn something new every time. So please do come visit me. All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us, especially on a beautiful night, and I hope to see you soon.